We're going to be looking at John uh, chapter 11. Um, I'm going to get there in a minute, but if you have a Bible, feel free to turn there. Um, And just while you're looking, I want you to think about this question. How would you finish this sentence? Everything is okay because... Think about maybe an awful day that you've had recently and think about what you've told yourself in those moments where everything has felt like it's crashing down. What have you told yourself in that moment to feel better about life? Everything's okay because ultimately I'm fine because I have or I am. I wonder how you'd fill in that blank for yourself. And whatever that thing is for you, and it's different for all of us, and it might change day to day, it might be one thing one day and one thing another... Ultimately, that thing is taking a place in our hearts that only God wants to take, that only God is meant to take. And the Bible calls that thing an idol. It calls it a fake God. Um, And we all have them. I have plenty. I'm sure you do as well. Fake gods in our lives. Some of us are aware of them. Some of us aren't aware of them. Uh, Tim Keller is an an author and a pastor uh, in the States. He's written a lot about fake gods. uh, And he, he says this, and hopefully the quote will come up on the screen. He says, an idol, a fake god, is anything more important to you than God. Anything you seek to you seek to give you what only God can give, like peace or meaning or hope or help. Anything that's so central and essential to your life that should you lose it, your life would hardly feel worth living. So just imagine about that thing that finishes that sentence for you. Everything's okay. Life's worth living because. And now imagine that that thing were to be taken away from you. Just imagine for a moment how you'd feel. What would happen to your internal world? If you're anything like me, it would crumble. It would fall apart. And many of us, when we're thinking about those things, we might be thinking of things that that are good things. Yeah, maybe some of us in this room might have thought about stuff that we know is bad, like excess drinking or drugs or using pornography as coping mechanisms. But I imagine that most of us are probably, we'd finish that sentence with good things. Our families, our kids, our work, our homes. Tim Keller again. He says, anything can serve as a fake god especially the very best things in life. And I I think the danger that we all face as Christians every day is to turn good things into ultimate things. That we take good gifts that God has given us and we actually place them in the place of the creator who's given them. We turn good things into ultimate things. And as Christians, every single day, we're in a war against idolatry. In my heart, I'm in a war to put Jesus first, to put him number one. And you know, I think, I was reflecting on this this week, I think Christianity has the most wonderful and the most heartbreaking and hard thing to say to each one of us. And it's this, you don't realise that Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all that you have. You don't realise that Jesus is all that you need until Jesus is all that you have. And I think that's a wonderful thing that Christianity tells us because it means that the best thing can never be taken away from us. There's nothing in this life, not illness or death or time or poverty that can take Jesus away from you if you're a Christian. Nothing can take him from us. But it's also heartbreakingly hard because if you're anything like me, you love other things in the place of Jesus often, that Jesus will, in love, slowly take away from us until we see that he is all that we need. And that process hurts, doesn't it? When those layers of idolatry get peeled back and we realise, actually, I've been trusting in other things for my happiness and my purpose other than God. I just want you to consider the day that one day you stand before Jesus. Your family and your home and your job and your ministry or whatever else it is, none of those things are going to be there On that day, they'll all have been peeled away and only Jesus will remain. And in that moment, the Bible tells us, we all realise finally and really and truly that Jesus is all that we need. In that moment, he's all that we have and he is everything that we need. He will satisfy every single desire of our hearts. He will complete us in a way that we never knew that we could be completed And that's not to say that we can't still enjoy the good gifts that God gives us now of job and family and friends and other stuff. 
But what God wants for us is for us to order our loves properly, that we have him at the top, and then we realize that everything else takes its place underneath him. And when we have Jesus at the top, we actually love other things better because we love them for his sake, not selfishly for ours. And that's going to be true in eternity as well. In the new creation, we'll enjoy working and other people and we'll enjoy all the things around us, but we won't look to them to complete us or fill us with happiness anymore because our happiness will be found in Jesus. And all of that is an introduction to the passage that we're going to look at today because the passage that we're going to look at shows us three things. It shows us, firstly, that we all have idols. We all have fake gods that we put our trust in. It also shows us that Jesus threatens our idols because he loves us and that Jesus is the only one who can rescue us from our idols. So we're going to read John chapter 11, verse 45 to 57. Therefore, many of the Jews who'd come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. And what had Jesus done? He'd just raised Lazarus from the dead in the past passage. But some of them went to the Pharisees and they told them what Jesus had done. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing? They asked. Here is this man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. Then one of them, named Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. You don't realize that it's better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. He did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. And not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God to bring them together and make them one. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. Therefore, Jesus no longer moved about publicly among the people of Judea. Instead, he withdrew to a region near the wilderness, to a village called Ephraim, where he stayed with his disciples. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, many went up from the country to Jerusalem for their ceremonial cleansing before the Passover. They kept looking for Jesus, and as they stood in the temple courts, they asked one another, What do you think? Isn't he coming to the festival at all? But the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that anyone who found out where Jesus was should report it so that they might arrest him. So to set the scene for this story so far, we get told in verse 45 that some of them who'd seen what Jesus did raising Lazarus from the dead, they went to the uh, Pharisees and they told them what Jesus had done. They basically snitched on Jesus. They're not saying... Look what Jesus has done as in, wow, it's amazing. He raised someone from the dead. What they're saying is, guys, you need to do something about this. There's a threat here. And we see in this story that we all have idols because we see, we get a glimpse into the hearts of these Pharisees, these religious rulers. We get a glimpse into what their idols are in this story. Verse 48, if we let him, Jesus, go on like this, healing people, doing good things, Everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and they will take away both our temple and our nation. What made these guys life worth living? What was it that they most feared losing? They most feared losing their, their temple and their nation. And apparently the Greek actually doesn't say their temple. It just says their place. What mattered to them most in life was their position of power and authority And they're worried. I think we can often find what our idols are by what we fear losing. They're afraid that if Jesus keeps on becoming so popular and people follow him, then the the Romans are going to think there's an uprising here. We're going to come and and crush it and we're going to remove the leaders of the temple so they can't do their job anymore. What they're most worried about is losing their position, their power. Uh, There are different writers who talk about the difference between what they call surface idols and deep idols idols. We might have stuff on the surface that seems to be providing our lives with meaning and with purpose in place of God, but often those things are just the tip of the iceberg. So I've got a a little diagram for you as an example. So uh, it should come up in a sec. There we go. Um, So idolatry is sin, and idolatry always leads to sin. But take this as an example. So Let's, I'll use myself as, as the example. So if the sin on the surface that everyone else can see is greed, you know, you'd look at me and you'd say, that guy is greedy. 
What these, what these people are saying is that underneath that, there's an idol. There's something that I'm placing my trust in to make me feel uh, that, that life matters, and it's money. You know, what I love the most is money. But then underneath that, why do I love money? It could be because I'm looking for power or approval or comfort or control or success. That's what's going on deeper down. And those deep idols, we can have one of those but still take the same course. So someone might deep down idolize power and they might use money to make them feel powerful because, uh, and it's that desire for power that makes them feel greedy. Or it might be that someone deep down, they idolize approval, they want people to like them, and so they, they use money to get people to like them, and that makes them greedy. Or maybe someone worships comfort. What matters to them most in life is just being comfortable, and money helps them to get the stuff that they want, and therefore, they're greedy for money. But it's what's going on at the root in those deep idols that really matters. And for these religious leaders, I think the obvious sin in their life is pride. It's arrogance in their position and in their national identity. And we see all throughout the Gospels that these religious leaders, they look down on other people, they judge them, they use people for their own ends. They don't treat people well because actually what they really deep down want is power. They want power and control over people. That's the deep idol in their lives. The surface idol is the, is the temple and is the fact that they have this job there. But the reason that that matters to them is because they want to use that to control people, to exert power over people. And I want us to apply this to ourselves for a moment. Think about a sin that you've committed this week. Here's a list of some of mine. Um, I've gotten angry this week. I've been selfish this week. I've been lazy this week. I could probably go on and on. But I'm going to pick anger just as an example for you. So if the surface sin in my life this week has been anger, I think the, uh, the idol, the surface idol, is wanting to get my own way. You know, what matters to me is getting my own way. But I think underneath that in my own life as I've examined myself this week, it's control. That's the deep idol, deep down, is I want the world to run according to my plans. I want ultimately to play the role of God because I want the world to be ordered in the way that I think it should. That's what's going on under the surface deep down when I get angry. It's that I think I deserve to be God in my life and for other people to act and respond in the way I think they should, and when they don't, I get angry. I wonder about you. Just take a moment to apply that to you. Think about something that's happened in your life this week where you've thought, I know that was wrong. What do you think is going on under the surface? What do you think that surface idol is? What do you think the deep idol is? You know, Jesus loves us, and because he loves us, he wants to free us from sin by tearing down our surface idols and by digging up our deep idols. Jesus threatens our idols because he wants to be the center of our lives. You know, we were made to know God. We were made for him to be the center, a bit like a car that's made to run on petrol. If you put diesel in the tank, it's just not going to work properly. And Jesus is saying, hey, I am what you need. I'm the petrol that you need in the tank of your life. Stop running to the diesel of this world. Stop running to things that say that they will fill you and satisfy you and make things the way you want them to be because they just won't. And we see in this story so we've seen already that everyone has idols, and we also see that Jesus threatens our idols. Whatever your, your idols are in your life, they are in direct competition with Jesus, because there's only one throne in our hearts, and Jesus says, that's mine. James chapter 4 verse 5 tells us this, that he, God, he yearns jealously for the spirit that he's put in us. Exodus 20 tells us that the Lord our God is a jealous God. Do you know that God is jealous for you today? Did you know that? He's jealous, not in a, not in a petty kind of way, not in a, uh, you know, I wish I had what they had, but that he, he longs for you to be fully his, and it breaks his heart when you're not. You know, the religious leaders here, I think they instinctively know that Jesus threatens their idols, and therefore they plan to get rid of him. In verse 49, we read that uh, one of them named Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, he spoke up. He said, you know nothing at all. Don't you realize it's better for one man to die, than for the pe die for the people than that the whole nation perish? What he really means is this. We need to kill this guy 
before his actions lead to what we really love getting taken away from us. You know, if Jesus threatens our idols because he wants to be number one, that means that Jesus can often be a threat to us. I wonder if there's areas of your life that, if you're honest, Jesus threatens, that you think, I want to live my life this way, but Jesus is saying, no, if I'm the center, you can't do that anymore. What's Jesus threatening in your life? Why is it that sometimes I don't want to open my Bible, and I don't want to pray, and I don't want to come to church? I think it's often because I'm shielding an idol from the spirit sanctifying surgery that will happen if I allow myself to be in the presence of God. I want that thing to be protected, not ripped down. I wonder if you've ever seen the film The Lord of the Rings or read the books. I think it gives one of the best examples of what idolatry does to us if we cling on to it. Um, in, in the last film, one of the last scenes is Gollum, this creature. He's obsessed with the ring of power, so much so that in, in the middle of this volcano, he bites it off of Frodo's finger, and as he does so, he falls down into the lava. And it's a great shot in the film because Gollum's face, as he falls with this ring to his death, is one of complete happiness and complete joy because he's finally got the thing that he yearned for, his idol. He's given everything for it. He's ultimately sacrificed everything for this thing that is just about to destroy him completely. And that's exactly what idolatry does. It consumes our hearts and it ultimately will destroy us in the end. And the fact that we can be completely in love with it doesn't change that fact. But I think this story also tells us that Jesus is the one who's come to free us from our idols. You know, Jesus said, who, who the Son sets free is free indeed. Because idolatry makes us slaves. Here's another great quote from Tim Keller. He said, The person who seeks power is controlled by power. The person who seeks acceptance is controlled by the people he or she wants to please. We do not control ourselves. We are controlled by the Lord of our lives. We're controlled by the thing that we idolize. That thing is in the driving seat. We think that we are using our idols to give us satisfaction and meaning and purpose, but actually they are using us. They're draining the life from us. And we see that in this story in verse 53. From that day, they plotted to take Jesus' life. You know, the religious leaders, they're controlled by their idolatry. They have to do whatever it takes to protect their idol, their position of, of, of authority and of power. And therefore, for them, that includes even killing an innocent person. You know, the idol of their position is in the driving seat there, making their decisions for them. And we know from the rest of the story that eventually their plan succeeds, that Jesus is arrested and he's killed. But read these next lines. Verse 54 tells us, Jesus no longer moved about publicly among the people of Judea. He'd heard that they wanted him killed. Instead, he withdrew to a region near the wilderness, to a village called Ephraim, where he stayed with his disciples. Why is that detail in there? John wants us to know who's in control of what happens next. Jesus doesn't die on a cross because these religious leaders choose to kill him. Jesus is, in, is the one who's in control of what happens next. It seems like he's run away, and he could have just stayed out of Jerusalem. He could have not gone to Passover. He could have just laid low for a bit, and then all of the plots and plans of the religious leaders would have come to nothing. And that's what people expect him to do. We read that in verse 55 and 56. People are saying to each other, what do you reckon? He's not here. Is he even going to come? There's speculation about whether he's going to turn up or not. But Jesus does. He chooses to go into Jerusalem in the very next chapter, and he chooses to walk to the cross. And why? He goes to the cross to rescue these people and you and me from our idols. Skip back to verse 51 to 52. Caiaphas, the high priest, We've already seen him say, it's better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. And what he meant was, let's kill this guy, he's in our way, he's, he's threatening our position. But John, who wrote this biography of the life of Jesus, he makes this comment. He says, he didn't say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. 
And not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God to bring them together and make them one. You know, Caiaphas was speaking in this moment, but actually in this moment, God was also speaking. And even though they're the same words, they don't mean the same thing. Caiaphas is saying, let's kill him. But God in this moment is saying, yes, one man is going to die for the nation. And not just for the nation, but for the world so that they can be saved. Jesus' death for these people, would tear down their surface idol of the temple. Because when Jesus died on the cross, the curtain was torn in two from top to bottom to say, this place is meaningless now. It doesn't matter. You can't meet with God here anymore. When Jesus died on the cross, he uproots their deep idol of pride by showing them that their primary identity isn't as powerful religious authorities, but their primary identity is as sinners who need a savior, people who need God to send his son to rescue them, that they're not as good as they thought that they were. They couldn't save themselves. And the death of Jesus ultimately undermines their idolatry of national identity. In 1 Peter, uh, Peter speaks to the church and he says, once you weren't a people, but now you're the people of God. When Jesus died on the cross, he was making a new people so that it wasn't the nation of Israel that mattered anymore. It was the people that God had chosen and called. So as Jesus dies on the cross, all of these idols that they place their faith in, they crumble. And that's true of our idols too. When we bring them to the cross, we see that they're worthless. We see they can't save us. They can't rescue us. They can't fix us. They can't give us hope. And we'll discover that one way or another. Because throughout life, as life kicks us, and as we have hardship and grief and all the other things that we go through in this life we'll find out sooner or later that our idols won't help us. We'll run to them. They won't fix us. They'll promise a lot, but they won't deliver. The only way to be free of your idols is to come to the cross and is to lay them down and is to say, Jesus, I see they can't do what only you can do. Take their place, I pray. That's what we need to do today to Jesus. I think the analogy that best uh, sums up my heart is like the den of a bear. I think that often uh, if the bear is gone, little rodents will crawl in and they inhabit this place. And it might be that one rodent runs in and pushes another one out and then another rodent comes in and a bigger one eats that one and runs out. It's only when the bear returns that everything else flees. It's only if Jesus is in the centre that I won't keep making new idols or welcoming new idols in. Uh, I think it was... Uh, one of the reformers who said that our hearts are like idol factories. We will keep on churning out things to give us meaning and purpose and satisfaction. And when they disappoint us, we'll just make a new one. We'll bump from one idol to, the, to another until Jesus is on the throne of our hearts. One last quote from Tim Keller. He says, The only way to free ourselves from the destructive influence of counterfeit gods is to turn back to the true one, the living God, He's the only one who, if you find him, can truly fulfill you. And if you fail him, can truly forgive you. And that's the thing about our idols, is they they have no grace for us. They have no mercy for us. If if your idol is control, if you can't control something, you're you're just battered with shame and with guilt and with pressure. But Jesus is the only one who, when we fail him, he says, I love you. I forgive you. Come back. So I just wanted us to uh, respond to that by taking a bit of time to uh, have some honest confession before God. Um, Psalm 139, the psalmist writes, Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. And uh, I'm just going to put a table up um, that I found on the internet that I thought was really, really helpful that talked about the four main types of deep idols that we all struggle with at different times. And I'm just going to give us a moment to to read this and to ask God to reveal what deep idol it is that you keep running to for meaning and purpose. So the way that the table works is it describes the deep idols uh, on the left-hand side, and then it kind of has some sentences that help you work out if that's the case for you. So uh, my life only has meaning or purpose if I'm successful and have influence and win might suggest that your deep idol is power. If your worst nightmare is rejection, it might suggest that your deep idol is approval. If people around you often say they feel unloved, that could be because 
your deep idol is control. Or if your biggest emotional problem is anger, it might be that power is the thing for you. So I'm just going to say a prayer. I'm just going to ask God to, to shine the light of his Holy Spirit on our hearts to help us see who we really are. Because it's only when we're honest with God about who we really are that we can receive his grace as it really is for us. So let me pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you that it's your kindness that leads us to repentance. And I thank you that uh, when you show us what we're really like in our hearts, you don't do it to condemn us. You don't do it to make us feel shame or, or to leave us in our guilt. But you do it so that you can heal us, so that you can show us where, we, yeah, where we're wounded, so that you can fix us. So Lord, I pray right now, Holy Spirit, would you come and would you show us what things it is that we keep running to? whether we run to power or approval or comfort or control. Lord, we want to say now these are things that, that only you can truly give us and so we, that only you truly have. And so we just ask in this moment, would you help us to see the state of our hearts and to see and to know that you are all that we really need. And then I just want you to hear these words. If you'd say that power is your deep idol, God has unqualified and limitless power. We don't have to seek power as we can find all the power that we ever need in him. We no longer have to exert our will or dominance over others. If you'd say that approval is the place you go to, we all have the approval, we have all the approval that we'll ever need in Jesus. Through Jesus' work on our behalf, we're eternally approved of by the God of all creation, who pours out his love and his favor and his acceptance to us in Jesus. God approves of you today. If you'd say that your deep idol is comfort, our relationship with Jesus provides never ending security, peace, and rest in a way that nothing else ever can. And lastly, if you'd say that your idol is control, we were never in control anyway, but we serve a God who has sovereign rule over all of the universe. And in the one moment where the world looked most out of control, the death of the Son of God on the cross, God was the most in control. He was working his plan of salvation that he'd carried through the ages. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, in this moment, we want to say, would you, would you sit on the throne of our hearts? Lord, we're sorry, we repent for all of the ways that we've run to things that we have thought would fill us up and have just turned out to be broken cisterns, cracked and dry. They've left us thirsty and wanting and guilty and dirty and full of shame. Lord, we want to run back to you and we thank you that your arms are wide open for us. Help us to live for you. Help us to love you. Jesus, would you take the the number one spot in our hearts this week and for the rest of our lives, Lord. Jesus, would you take your rightful place in our hearts, we pray. Lord, we often pray for revival. Lord, we pray, would you send revival, but would you start with us? If we're spiritually sleepy this afternoon, would you wake us up? Would you give us a bigger vision of who you are? Would you be the thing that truly just satisfies every single longing of our hearts, Lord? We pray that you would be bigger and greater and more beautiful to us than we could ever possibly imagine. In the name of Jesus. Amen.